St Pancras is one of the most famous stations in London, but also, when you think about it, one of the most curiously named. I mean, Pancras isn't exactly something you'd call your child now, is it? Would you call your child Pancras? Let me know in the comments section. So who was this St Pancras, and why do they have a station? Well, Pancras is better known as Pancras of Rome, also known in Latin as Pancratius. His name in ancient Greek means he who holds all. Frankly, I think it's very cruel to name your son after a type of bag, but these were tough times. Incidentally, I know St. Pancras is often mispronounced as St. Pancreas, so while I'm here, I'm going to explain that the word Pancreas means all flesh. Hence the similarity of the name, if nothing else. Pancras was born in Phrygia Salutaris, in what is now part of modern-day Turkey. We believe it was around the year 289. He was orphaned at the age of eight and moved to Rome with his uncle. While there, he converted to Christianity. This was not a good time to be a Christian. Christianity was illegal in the Roman Empire. But, on the whole, the authorities had tended to turn a blind eye. Many citizens viewed Christians as suspicious with their insularity, their secrecy, and the fact that they were just different. They were liable to be accused of black magic, of obscene practices, of plotting to undermine society. Actual official persecution was sporadic and varied from emperor to emperor. But things were changing. Emperor Gallienus had issued a decree of toleration, which was exactly what it sounds like. A law ending persecution of the faith. Christianity had gone from an obscure Middle Eastern cult to a religion followed by some quite prominent and wealthy people, particularly in the cities. By the birth of Pancras, it is estimated that around 10% of the population of the empire were Christian. If Christians decided to stop rendering unto Caesar, and to turn against the empire, they could pose a significant threat. Emperors often used religion as a means of justifying their power, forming their own cults or associating themselves with a particular god. So you can see how they might not be too happy with important citizens deciding that they didn't believe in those gods. Consequently, persecution was stepped up again. Christians were forced to participate in Roman religious rites, such as sacrifice. Bishops were put on trial and executed. Diocletian was a conservative in terms of his political and religious views, and so naturally he wasn't enthusiastic about Christianity when he became emperor. He published an edict against them. Christian gatherings were prohibited and their churches and scriptures to be destroyed. Christians were stripped of many of their legal rights, as well as any official positions or military ranks. If they were freed slaves, they could be forced back into slavery. In theory, there was no capital punishment, but in practice, the local officials of the empire, particularly in the east, interpreted no bloodshed to mean lots of bloodshed. Burning alive was a favourite method of dealing with those who wouldn't comply. And this is where our boy Pancras comes into the story. In the year 303, he and his uncle were found to be sheltering their fellow Christians. They were arrested and brought before the authorities of Rome. The authorities presented Pancras with an ultimatum. Show his devotion to Rome by burning incense in honour of the gods, or face the consequences. Pancras refused. The incident caught the attention of Diocletian himself, who was surprised not only by the young man's strength of will, but by the fact that he was only fourteen. Therefore, he summoned Pancras before him and made a different offer. Renounce his faith and be rewarded with high rank and wealth. Still, Pancras refused. Diocletian, enraged, ordered that the boy be decapitated, which he was, publicly, just outside the city. Unfortunately for Diocletian, the execution of what must have seemed a fairly insignificant young man had the opposite effect to that intended. He joined the ranks of early martyrs of the church. A basilica was raised over the site of his grave, in which his head is still preserved today. A decade later, Emperor Constantine legalised Christianity with the Edict of Milan, and another decade later, it was the official religion of the Roman Empire. Now, it should be stated that much of this tale is disputed from a historical perspective. For one thing, the dates don't line up. 
And, of course, it was common for the church to exaggerate the lives of its saints to paint them in a better light. What is true, though, is that Pancras became a highly influential figure in death. Swearing an oath on the relics of St Pancras was considered to be legally binding because if you told a lie afterwards, you would be killed by demons. Citation needed. He would become the patron saint of children, health and jobs, and his feast would be held on the 12th of May. In the 6th century, Augustine of Canterbury was sent by the Pope to England with some of Pancras' relics, in the hope of converting King Ethelbert and the rest of the nation. The mission was a success, and as a result, many early churches in England were dedicated to St Pancras, including one in what is now London, which gave its name to a parish, which gave its name to a station. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, then please do hit the like button and subscribe to be kept up to date with future videos. I'd like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon. You are the basilica to my head. And I'll see you all again very soon. Cheerio.